Entrepreneurial Edge is brought to you by Business Banking from FNB. Because small ideas can lead to big business. FNB, how can we help you? It's tough out there as an entrepreneur. It's hard work, money's tight, and often your customers are very hard to please. How wonderful it would be for someone to phone you up one day and tell you you're the best. Now that's going to happen to a handful of lucky entrepreneurs this year through the Ernst & Young World Entrepreneurs Awards. We'll be talking to a couple of the finalists later in the programme. But first, let's take a look at what these awards are all about. Ernst & Young's World Entrepreneur Awards started in the United States in 1986. Ernst & Young have been running the programme for 25 years. South Africa adopted the programme in 1998. The awards have been adopted globally by all Ernst & Young practices in over 140 cities across 50 countries. Uh, we associate with entrepreneurs because what we look for are people that are focused on their vision and growth. And so we are also a firm that prides itself in nurturing entrepreneurs so that they become market leaders. So in celebrating and honoring entrepreneurs, Ernst & Young wants to be at the forefront. And with our experience of over 25 years dealing with entrepreneurs, um, I don't think there is any other program that would, we would want to be involved with. We need to continuously promote those people who are dreaming to make their dreams a reality. Not to sit with their dreams and watch TV and say, what am I going to do? They need to go out there and make sure that they realize their dreams. FNB are the primary sponsors for the South African program. FNB and First Rand Bank have been involved with the awards for the last six years. Apart from co-sponsoring, we get quite involved in scouring the earth with, uh, with Ernst & Young, looking for potential uh, nominations, uh, nominees, looking for those entrepreneurs out there that are scalable, particularly innovative, have the potential to employ a lot of people. Being considered as a finalist for these awards is a tough task especially with the current economic climate. Howard Arendt added that South African entrepreneurs face many challenges and a lot of work needs to be done around mindsets. We want to make, and it should be, that entrepreneurial space is, is, is a sexy place to be. A lot of really skilled people coming out of universities are, 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 are walking straight into corporate, corporate life um, and not, particularly people of colour, and, and not choosing the, the entrepreneurial space where they could actually make massive scalable differences. So there's a mindset issue. There's the regulatory environment, which is really quite a challenge uh, at, at the moment. To register a business, to stay registered is, 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 you know, is a challenge. Um, and um, we, need to, we need to work very hard to, to make it more easy to do business with. First National Bank tries really hard to make opening an account easy. Um, we, you can open an account 24-7 online. Uh, we give free, free um, bookkeeping services associated with a banking account. Uh, we give you free cell phone banking, free online banking. But more people, more institutions, um, and particularly the regulatory environment, need to work harder around that. Um, I think the, the and, and let's not forget the, how difficult it is, it is to, to, to employ people. The third, the third obstacle. I mean, there's, there, there are a number, but let's choose the, the you know, the larger ones, the more sig significant ones. Is the is the is the payment reality in South Africa? Government and large corporations, for that matter, are, are, are quite crucial in oiling the wheels of the economy. And um, if you just take take government, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between what's happening at uh, senior executive level, senior managerial level, and the big government, you know, quasi-government um, institutions, they all, all have an absolute intent to support employment, the entrepreneurs, and they work really hard to bring people of color, businesses, um, young businesses into their supply chains, into their value chains. But at the bottom, the payment reality is not kicking through like it should. A lot of businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs are going out of business. They're being stifled, they're being, um, you know, stressed unnecessarily um, through non-payment, or should we say slow payment. Uh, and that's a shame, because the intent really is there. The awards will see a panel of judges that are made up of winners from previous years, academics, captains of industry, and knowledgeable businessmen in the field of entrepreneurship. 
Um, what we look for, we look for uh, either founders or owner managers of a company, primarily people who are owning a stake at, at a company, and so the, the, the company needs to be at least uh, three years in existence. And we have uh, two categories, main categories, which is a master entrepreneur category. For those entrepreneurs that have been in business for more than uh, 10 years, they may have run one or more businesses, or they may be running one business, but we're looking for those individuals with the experience of running a, a business. But uh, we also assess them through the criteria of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, strategic direction, the innovativeness or creativity, the financial performance, which is most important, and also the global impact and community impact. Ernst Young globally looks at corporate social responsibility and giving back to communities as one of the major components of this. We also look at their personal integrity. Are they people that are regarded as role models in, in their societies? And also, how, we, how, how do they regard themselves? And wise, what's nice about our criteria is that it's the criteria that is applied globally uh, throughout the program, wherever it's run around the world. Now in the studio, we have a couple of the finalists. Louis Norval, the founder of Atfern Limited, a public and listed property fund. And then Keti Mkonza, the founder of Uma Technologies, an ICT and telecoms company, a company 100% owned by black women, so we say. So, gentlemen, um, what did you feel when you got this phone call suddenly to say, yeah, you're the best? Uh, look, it was excitement all the way, uh, Chris. Uh, I wasn't expecting, because you I look at the other guys I was up against, and really, the list was tough. So, I was just joy at, at all the way. Yeah. Now, Louis, you must have thought uh, for a moment there, maybe it's the bank or an irate customer. What did you think when it came through? You must be excited. No, I was totally surprised, uh, firstly, but um, especially the way we operate in sort of under the radar. Uh, you know, I was very surprised that they would uh, nominate somebody like me, and I was obviously elated uh, when told that uh, I'm a finalist. And let's just talk a little bit about your businesses now. Yourself, Keti, you're in, you're in IT. Yes. Um, just give us a little feel of what you do. Uh, look, we started purely just as a, an, an IT networking company. And as time moves on, we grew into the fiber, started specializing in the fiber networking space, where we do uh, design and basically implementation of fiber networks for the likes of the telecom big players like Vodacom, MTN, and Dark Fiber Africa. And Louis, I understand that you're uh, involved in shopping centers somewhere. Yes, Chris, we, um, we're a company that started out developing and managing primarily uh, major shopping centers and to a lesser extent uh, corporate office parks. But uh, in the latter years, we've been focusing on, on major shopping centers. So, Ketty, so how did you start out as an entrepreneur? I think, honestly, um, I, I'm always asked the question if you are born or you are made. I feel that I'm one of those who were born an entrepreneur. From an early age of nine, uh, my dad owned uh, a, a number of shopping centers in Soweto as well, and I always participated. He's always been an entrepreneur himself, so I, I, I didn't know anything else but just business, you know? And when I finished my tertiary education, I, I joined the likes of IBM, where I worked for four or so years and then join other entities. But this thing was just in me, you know. I, I, I always wanted to do something. I, I knew I had to do something with my life. And I wanted to start early, because I've seen other players in the market, you know. And if there's any errors, then at least I can go back to the corporate world. But fortunately for me, it went well till far, till this far. Louis, what were the humble beginnings for you as an entrepreneur? The day I registered as a quantity surveyor, uh, a partner and I started a quantity surveying practice because I always knew that I had to do my own thing and uh, ever since then I've, I've worked for myself, so to speak. Um, and then uh, after about a decade of that, I ventured into the development world and uh, together with three other partners, uh, we started developing properties and uh, in 2002 we actually put some of our assets uh, into a fund called Ad Fund, and that's how Ad Fund was born. So, Kathy, um, 
What was it? How tough was it for you to start out? But I know you've been in the business before you started your own thing. Yes. And how scary was it when you made that leap to being your own boss? I think um, I was caught up in a corporate world where it was a time. It was a time where I started earning a lot of money, and hence then you see Kuma being the hundred percent black owned. Because my wife said, you know what? If you're delaying any further, I'm gonna take this entity. I'd long registered it. And they said, I'm going to take this, I'm going to do it. And my sister joined her and they said, you know what, we're doing it. And within three or four months, I realized that I'm not going to win this battle. However, the, as much as I had to drive, but I think someone had to push me further than just myself. You know? One thing that strikes me about both of you, you could have had fairly comfortable lives, just carrying along, working, picking up a pay packet every month or so. Well, why did you decide, Louis, to go on your own? I think you've got that fire inside you, you know, it just mm -hmm. drives you and you know you can't work uh, for somebody else. I was fortunate very early in my career, uh, I was approached to uh, head up a pension fund or work in a pension fund and the gentleman that interviewed me said to me, it's a simple decision, you're either a corporate person or not, you've got to make that decision and I knew I wasn't, so I never hesitated knowing that I was doing the right thing, you know, so... Uh, you know, you, you just probably naively start out, but I think that's actually what makes an entrepreneur. They don't know all the risks necessarily. Mm -hmm. And from there, they just build it out and, and face and tackle problems as they come along. Well, speaking about the risk, Katie, I mean, like, how difficult was it in the early days? Of it, you know, when you've got debtors howling for money, people on the phone, customers complaining. What was it like? No, that's true. I always brag to people that I know all the debt collectors around run back <laughs> <laughs> or the sheriffs run because <laughs> uh, when I started uh, the only funds I had because I had sort of played in a property space where I, I just used to invest as a hobby where I would buy townhouses and all that and I had to sort of draw uh, money from that very same you know when before the National Credit Act um, you things were a bit easier. You were able to basically take the second bonds and all that. And that's how I basically funded my entity, uh, where I'll take the money from those very same uh, houses and uh, fund the business. But, you know, results were not coming as as fast as I had anticipated. And the sheriffs were knocking on, on each and every of my pro each and every one of my properties. And I got to know everyone, but I, I think those are, su are some of the joys when you look back and say, you know what, at some stage, there was a thing that says, uh, give up, you're not going to make it. And I, I just had, I, I kept going. Uh, and I'm grateful to the people that I started this with, my family, because they've been a great support for me. Louis, very quickly, um, how do you remember those happy days of living hand to mouth in the early days of an entrepreneur? Well, when, when in the 80s, when uh, we had the quantity surveying practice, you know, if ever you may not recall, but those were tough years. We virtually all of the 80s were dark and difficult times economically. Um, and when we started out at Fund in the early, uh, you know, in, in 2002, the shopping center domain was really the domain of the life offices and the big corporates. And we started out going head on against them. And at that time, nobody was prepared to develop. And we developed major shopping centers uh, in competition to, to institutions. And we were small guys starting out on our own, having to raise money, having to find tenants, fill up the the shopping centres uh, and uh, I think uh, we're very proud of, of the portfolio of shopping centres and other assets we've built up over the past nine years. Great gentlemen, hold those thoughts there. We want to talk a lot more to you in the second half about the issues in your respective businesses. It's time for a short ad break. We'll see you right after this.